Hello, and welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, when and how to specify arc flash protection relays, sponsored by Schneider Electric. I'm your moderator, Amara Rausgis, and I'm happy to be here today on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media and Technology. Here are some tips so you get the most from today's webcast. If you're experiencing issues with your slides or audio, refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's picture. You can control the volume of this webcast by adjusting the volume on your own computer or by adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you are having technical problems with audio or the slide presentation, click on the question mark at the top right corner of your screen for a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. But if you do need a technician, type a message in the Ask a Question box and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. Individual questions will be handled in the Answered Questions box. Type questions for the speaker in the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen. The live Q&A session will be near the end of this hour. Today's webcast is being recorded. You'll receive an email within about a week to the link of the on-demand event. You can watch this again at any time. To download a certificate of completion and a PDF copy of the presentation, use the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen. Those documents will also be available with the on-demand version of this webcast. I'm glad to introduce today's presenter, Farhad Muslemi. Farhad is an electrical engineer with more than 30 years of experience with emphasis in relay and protection. He has extensive background in relay programming, test, and commissioning. He's a principal application engineer for Schneider Electric USA. In this role, he is responsible for providing technical support to internal commercial teams and fault analysis and case studies to customers. Thanks for joining us, Farhad. Let's get started. Thank you everyone for joining to this uh, presentation. Today we will focus on arc flash protection, how we apply it, and what will cause the arc flash. At the beginning, let's look at some basics. The arc flash is a short circuit through, through the ionized gas. It could happen between face to ground or face to face. There is an extensive energy which will be released during the arc flash high pressure, heat, and sound waves. There will be also some vaporized solid material like a copper or aluminum, glass of molten metal, and radiant heat. Because of the nature of this phenomenon, we can categorize it as an electrical explosion. On the bottom right corner, you can see the correlation between the pressure change and temperature change over the time. In the fraction of the second, we will have a very high pressure and very high temperature. Then look at the, some effect of the arc. When we are having the arc incident, it will be intense light, radiation, burning, and blind. We will have a vaporized copper or vaporized material, whatever we have on the bottom with a very high volume, it will cause to have a very high pressure and toxic gases. We might, we might have a sh sharpness and molten metal. Other this high voltage definitely will be present. Heated air, pressure and sound wave, and finally very high temperature, up to 20,000 Kelvin. What are the effects of the fault over the body of human that's working close by to this system? There will be a infrared and UV radiation, and it could damage the eyesight and ended up to blindness. There will be a pressure shock. It can damage the lung, brain. If you are working on the height, sleeping and falling from the height will be another cause. Sound will be damaging the hearing, and lastly, 
psychological symptoms like a depressive disorder or workplace phobia. These are the ones that will affect the human. What caused the autism? One of the first ones that we can see is the human error. Human error like forgotten tools, bridging by tools in switch gear, using the wrong or misuse the tools, and error while we are working with the live part that see moving the enclosure door. And in this picture, we can see there is a wrench left and a short circuit between the face and ground. Another cause is poor connection. It could be due to loose connection, as we can see in the thermal image on the right-hand side. Could be vibration and insufficient mechanical design. Another cause is the component failure. Cable terminal, CTVT components, they could damage. And lastly, animal. It could be rat, snake, anywhere around the system. It depends on the geog geographical location that we are. One of the most important points that we have to consider is the time. On the left-hand side, there are the damage caused by the current and the time to the low voltage switch gear. As we can see, as long as we are having longer time of the arcing, so higher value of the short circuit current we will have severe damage to this system. The start from surface smoke, then get to the surface damage, and finally burn through the switch. And on the right-hand side, the graph is showing amount of the energy, incident energy that it will dispatch from the arc. This test has been done in 480 volts with the 65 kilo amp, and the energy is measured with the 24-inch distance from the arc. If we go around the two milliseconds, we will have less energy. This two milliseconds, we put it because this is the operation time we are expecting from the arc track system. And when we are applying different systems, let's say if we use the uh, zone selective interlocking, we will be around 150 milliseconds. And the energy will be 10 calorie per square centimeter. It can easily put us in category two for the arc track. Now we can look at the effect of time. When time is increasing, energy, which is very close to the, approximately close to the I squared T, it will increase. After almost 100 milliseconds, cable will cut to fire. If we get more time, copper will catch the fire, and finally steel will catch the fire. Basically, the amount of the damage from arcing will be depend on the current, time, type of the switch gear, distance, PPE that we are using. But we can categorize some of these parts of the time. If we are capable to remove the arc within 100 milliseconds, most likely personal and equipment damage could sustain or with the little damage and injury. Longer time, it will cause the damage to personal and equipment. And if we sustain more than 500 milliseconds, definitely it will be an expensive damage to the personnel and the equipment. Then we are dealing with the arc flash detection system. The total time will be including detection time, control time, and operation. Operation is breaker operation time. What we can control in our system is detection and control part of that. This is our target. If we can apply the proper system to detect the arc within two milliseconds, and we add up breaker operation time two to five cycles, three to five cycles, we are targeting around 80 milliseconds maximum. And that's a good target to apply the arc like system. Let's see what the standard is telling us. On NEC 240-87, is recommending if you are dealing with the 1200 amp breaker and higher current, we have to use one method of reducing the arc or reducing the clearing time. These are the methods are recommended with this standard. Zone selective interlocking, 
differential relaying, energy reduction maintenance switch or ERMS using the arc flash protection and recently added two more stage for another instantaneous and override over current and approval equivalent method, which is like a written agreement between the engineer and operator. Now, when we are applying this method, we can put it in one example. Basically, any C mitigation method, we can categorize them to two parts protection based method and direct arc detection. Amongst the protection methods, one of the fastest ones is a bus bar differential. Since we do not have to coordinate with any other protection outside of the switch gear. Now we want to apply this mechanism to this switch gear with one incomer and four outgoing feeders. When we are applying the differential, the protected zone will be dictated by location of the CT. Where are the CT in this switch gear? Basically, they will locate it at the breaker area, incoming and outgoing. So the protected zone will be the green area. This is not necessarily entire switch gear. We are from CT to CT. Now we can apply our 87B or bus bar differential protection. Now here is the question, how about the cable termination and the line side VT? They will be out of the zone. This orange area at the top and on the bottom. These are out of the protection zone, but they are part of the switch. What we can do, we can use some sort of arc sensor to detect the arc in those areas as well. And by that, we can cover everything. Okay, now we want to apply the arc flash system. What method we have to use? We can use the pressure sensor. We can use the light sensor. First, look at the pressure sensor. When we are using the pressure sensor, we have to consider that pressure does not rise in DAC. This is one research that has been done in one cubicle. They, they put it in the four different stages. At the beginning, we will have a compression and pressure rise. It will take around three to 10 milliseconds. Then when the pressure relief open in the switch gear, pressure will drop down, will be a stage B. It's gonna take again five to, 10, five to 10 milliseconds. Then we will have emission and gas exhaust. Pressure will start to decrease, area C, and finally we will go to pressure equalization in part B. So this one is showing, and in the next slide, you will see as well that the pressure increase in the cell will take some time. In the right hand side, when we increase the current, pressure maximum peak will come almost around 10 milliseconds after the wave of the current. Even the manufacturer who are building the sensor like this sensor, which is dedicated to arc flash detection based on the pressure, they are saying this is a fast detection pressure wave generated by the arc, but the detection time, they claim is detection time for 10 to five, uh, for around 10 milliseconds. Another way is to detect the arc. This test is proving that the light appear practically instantly when the arc is started. The solid line is energy of the arc and the dotted line is light intensity. They are almost appearing at the same time. So light, definite is, the, light is definitely a faster way to detect the arc flash. Now we are applying the light, what type of sensor we have to use? Okay, we decided to go with the light now, these are the type of the sensors that are available in the market. Basically, there are two types of sensors, point sensor and loop sensor. Point sensor is all the sensor except the bottom left one, which is the bare fiber optic, that we call it loop sensor. When we are using the sensor, one thing that will change first 
is the sensitivity. Something that manufacturer will say it will be 8,000 lux. Second thing that we have to consider, what is the spectrum of the light this sensor can send? There are some extra information as well available. What's the power supply for wetting this sensor? What is the current drain? What is the active current? When the sensor activates it, how much current it will, it will drain? One important point is, do they have a self-supervision capability? If you lost the sensor, you short circuit the sensor, will the system detect it or not? And lastly, detection area. How far we can go with, by using one of the sensors? Rule of the thumb, very common among all of these sensors, is six to seven feet. So one sensor, it will cover up to six to seven feet. We talk about the sensitivity. What is the sensitivity looks like? Just to have some sort of feeling, some base point, 50 lux means this is something close to the light that you can see in the family room. Office, 300 to 500 lux. Daylight, direct sunlight is 32,000 up to 130,000 lux. And how about the arc flash? 20,000 up to 1 million lux. Something close to sunlight. Majority of the arc flash sensor that we saw if they expose to the sun, they will activate. So the arc flash is very intense light and it can easily operate all of these sensors. Now how about the spectrum of the light? If you look at the visible, visible light, which is coming out of the incandescent light, we are dealing with the 400 up to 900 nanometer spectrum of the light. This is a normal visible light. If you look at the test has been done in the arc flash, in the copper bus bar with the 65 kilo, 65 kilo and with the 10 millisecond duration, we can see, again, we will see the similar wavelength from 300 up to 900, milli, uh, 900 nanometer. So we have all the visible light spectrum, maybe some infrared and ultraviolet. And as we can expect, the majority of the energy or illumination is around the yellow and red light. So our sensor should cover entire spectrum of the light. Normally, all the manufacturers, they will put a graph with their sensor that how their sensor can sense from different angles. They will put different charts. Basically, sensors are having a volumetric and constant on the front of the sensor and less sensitivity in the back of the point sensors. But remember, when they are applying and using this sensor in the system, normally we have to consider that the light created by the arc it will be reflected from the walls and all the area. So we are not really worried that we are putting where we are putting our sensor. Here is a couple examples that we are applying the sensor. This is actual sensor that has been installed in the cable compartment. It's exposed to the cable, but we, we did not put it behind the cable. And that's enough to pick up any type of the fault. And here is the example putting the sensor in the bus bar compartment. At a closer look, sensor is sitting somewhere close to the bus, and we know the light will be reflected all around this cell. So that was about the sensors. Sometimes we will need to apply not only the light, we have to apply the current as well. So the detection of the arc has two options light or light plus the current. These are the two options that we can imagine. Now when we are deciding to apply the current, why we need to do that? Using the offset, using the current as a supervision signal will prevent nuisance tripping due to the external light source. Somebody opened the panel, 
or put the flashlight in the sensor, we don't want to trip. That's the reason we will decide that to go with the light plus the current. Now, when we are going to use the current, current measurement should be done as fast as possible. We are talking about a millisecond. If we use the conventional method of measuring the current, let's say half or full cycle sampling, it means we are adding eight to 16 millisecond delay to our measurement. What we are doing in the arc light system, this is one example. In this system, analog to digital filter will fit the CPU of the relay for regular measurement, overcurrent and measurement and other stuff. But we will have a comparator. This comparator is not gonna go through the filtering and some calculation. It's the direct comparator. And the operation of this comparator is around one millisecond or less. And it will directly fit to the FPGA of the relay, go directly to the matrix of the relay as a first priority. So when we are applying the current, we have some examples, they, they say, okay, we're gonna bring the current from the protective relay and connect it to the arc flash. It means we are putting the eight to 16 millisecond delay plus some signal. Now when we are applying the current to the system, we could measure the current and the light in the same relay, or we can have them in a separate relay. Since we may, we may face to have a different source of the current, we will need type of the signaling between the relays. So this current signal will be shared between different relays. And to having that, we will need the very specific and fast signaling method. We're not gonna use the direct uh, digital output and digital input. Those are all adding the extra delay. So we have to have the specific fast signaling method. Basically, for the good arc flash system, with using the high speed output contact, we are expecting for the light only or light plus the current to this system be operational below two milliseconds. Then look at the sample main, main main system. Main main system means we have only one bus. And this system is showing how we are applying the light only system. If any fault happen on the bus, we have to clear both of the main incoming. The blue line is showing some signaling and the green line as well. They are signal that we will pass the trip from the feeder up to the main incoming to clear entire system. This system, we should call it one zone system. In the next example, we are dealing with the main tie main. Let's see how we can close it. Let's see how we can put a different zone. First zone that we can imagine is the outgoing feeder cable compartment. If there is any fault in this area, in the green area. If there is a fault in the green area after the breaker, we will directly trip the breaker. This is the first zone. We can apply similar zone now to all the outgoing feeders. What is the, where is the next zone? That one could be the feeder breaker, Breaker itself, the orange one, we have to clear the entire bus. If there is a fault on the bus bar, also we have to clear the entire bus. Now we are having a next zone. Next zone, we include the main incomer on the left-hand side and the tie. If any fault happen in this area, we should treat main incomer and the tie. Similar principle would happen, apply to the right-hand side. Up to now, we covered outgoing plus the bus. Now, if there is a main incomer fault, we have to clear the bus and send the direct transfer strip to the remote. Similar for the incoming cable compartment. And finally, for the line VT. Any place in this area, we have to send the upstream direct transfer strip because this is out of the control of our switch. It will happen to both of them. This is the way that you can apply the light only to main time main system, the way that we are zoning. 
Next example is about uh, applying and using the current sensor. The rule of the thumb is we have to apply the current detection at any possible source. In this example, we are having two utility, two generator, and two bus. Then we have to put our relay with the current sensing element to all the sources. And if one source goes out, it means other source should pick it up. Then we will need the signal. This signaling will be connect all the relays to each other. That's the fast signaling between the relay with sensing the current. Now for having a proper selectivity, we will start to put our light sensors. On the left-hand side feeder 52F1, we don't have a current, we are only having the light. Now if we put our relay like R5, and we want to have a supervision with the current, we will connect it to the shared signal. So relay R5 is light only, but is receiving the signal from another relay. This relay can be set as a light plus the current combination, and these two relays will act as a light plus the current. Another example for applying the current system is to apply for this backup 911 emergency generator bus. In this example, we are having three generators and another generator bus which will be parallel with the similar one. In any incomer from the generator and incomer from the external bus, we put a current sensor. The same basic that I mentioned, we will need to put the current sensor in any possible source which is coming to our switch. Next one is talking about the zone, how we can detect the zone, how we have to apply zoning to our system. First example is to apply the zone to the low voltage switch gear. In the low voltage switch gear, normally we don't have a compartment, we don't have a barrier. This is an example of the switch gear. As we could see in this switch gear, if we have an arc, we don't know where is the source of the arc. It could come from the incomer cable, it could come from outgoing cable breaker, bus bar, all of them, they are count as one zone only. So it's very difficult to, it's very difficult to uh, put a different zone in one step. If, if we put this green area, we put a sensor, it will actually looking all around the entire system. That's the reason we always take, one of the practice is to use the loop sensor. Loop sensor or fiber optic sensor, we can see it in the right hand side in the bottom right corner. We can run the fiber optic cable all around the sensor, even the fuse boxes, breaker, and everything. Because in this case, we don't have a selectivity, we will just strip the main income. But the story is different when we are using and applying similar concepts to the medium voltage switch. For medium voltage switch case, what is important for us is the equipment layout. First thing that we will ask, we will ask about the section drawing of each set. In this example, we are having different sections. We have a cable compartment, we have a breaker compartment, TTVT compartment, and bus bar compartment. Then, since we are have a proper barrier in this system, we can say first compartment or cable compartment could be take to account as one zone. Then we can put one sensor there. Similarly, we can apply it to the bus box and put the sensor. ET, in this case, we had this extra seat in the feeder, another sensor. And finally, the breaker itself. Now we know for typical feeder protection, we are putting four sensors. If we feel there is extra stuff in the cable compartment, let's say, now we can add one more sensor to the system. This is one example for the feeder. 
Similarly, you can look at the, let's say, VT compartment. VT compartment, again, we are having a zone, but it will be less. Now we are having a bus bar compartment. Then we are having our transition bus. And finally, VT. Now we, we decided how many sensors we need for our VT compartment. We already figured out how many we need for our uh, bus bar compartment, uh, feeder compartment. Now we can apply everything to our single line diagram. With a single line diagram, we already know, let's say, for our tiebreaker, we need four sensors. For our station, bar, station service transformer, we need three sensors. For the VT, we need a couple sensors and typical feeder, four sensors. Now we can apply same basic to everything, and now we can count how many zones we have, how many sensors we need, and where to apply them, where to put our trip. Putting the sensor in the switch gear sometimes is coming predefined from the customer, uh, from the manufacturer. In this example, manufacturer already prefabricated the sensor, put them in the proper location and test it. They put three sensors in this example, one for the bus bar, one for the circuit breaker, one for the cable compartment. And here's the sensor on the top. This is another example. Again, they put for bus wall compartment, circuit breaker compartment, and the VT compartment. So sometimes we need to define it, sometimes manufacturers will define it for us. Okay, I want to just share one site experiment. We talk about the zoning, we talk about the selection of the current and selection of the different zone. But what else remains? Let's see, let's look at the, this site experiment. This incident happened in the 12.47 kV, 3000 metal class switch gear, and ended up to destroy majority of the switch gear. They ended up to change the entire switch gear and put the new system. What caused this issue after they did the investigation, the issue was coming from the VT compartment. And the issue was due to the VT truck racking operation. How the system was, looks like before the incident, <clears throat> system was feeding from one generator and incomer B. So the, the, the red area was all closed arc was in the truck of the VT. And if you look at the single line diagram in more detail, incoming and over current relay they use, and they had an arc flash relay as well. Incident happened in this uh, VT on the left hand side. How they put their arc flash system, they use the relay. They put the sensor in the VT compartment, they put it in the breaker compartment, they put it on the bus bar and another bus VT. So sensor was properly put in the system. When the arc happened, directional relay detect the fault, but did not have a chance to trip before the overcurrent relay trip. Record shows that the arc flash system was picked up in and cleared the fault in 69 milliseconds, including the breaker operation. Very quick, detect the fault and open the breaker. System looks like this one after the operation. We open the main incomer B and we, the uh, position of these two was unknown. I just left them closed. But the issue is we open the circuit which we're feeding the fault. The problem was after we open the breaker internally from our plant, current was keep feeding from the remote end. And feeding from the remote end caused the damage of the switch gear. What happened in the remote end? The relay at the remote end see the fault, pick up, 
and operate at the time that it's supposed to do it, as a backup overcurrent. What happens, the remote relay operates around 711 milliseconds. During this time, the, the main incomer was feeding the, the fault and almost blew up everything before it treated the Everything was working properly. Backup was working, internal system was working, but what was the issue? Let's just put the conclusion summary on this one. The ultralight sensor installed in the proper location, fault detected correctly, seen by the ultralight system. Ultralight stripped the incomer in 69 milliseconds. Upper stream relay saw the fault and acts as a backup. 711. Since there was not any direct transfer strip or interstream signal between the arc flash detection system and the upper stream breaker, fault clearance was relying on the utility incomer relay that took about 711 milliseconds. It means when we are designing such a system and we are having interface with the remote substation or utility there should be some sort of agreement to give them a trip signal in case of the incident to send the proper trip signal or direct trip signal to the remote end. If we had this signal in this case, we never had an incident. We could clear the fault around 69 plus operation time of the remote relay. Okay, that was my last slide and I will hand it over to you, Amal. All right, excellent. Thank you very much for that information. And now Farhad Moslemi will answer questions. Type your questions for the presenter in the ask a question box on your screen and we'll get to as many as time allows. Questions that we do not get to today will be posted online at www.csemag.com with the archived version of this webcast. Please remember to download a certificate of completion or a copy of the presentation. Use the event resources tab on the left side of your screen. All right, Farhad, let's take on this first question. Uh, why would a low voltage system cause more severe arc flashes relative to medium voltage or high voltage. Could you give us a little bit of information about that? Uh, well, basically you can say in the low voltage system, we are dealing with the very high current. And in the high voltage system, we are dealing with the low current. When we are dealing with the high current, the ionizing, the gas will happen very quick. It doesn't mean that if you are having a low voltage system, we are, we are having a low voltage, low, low current system. Normally, that's exactly the reason. In the low voltage system, we are dealing with a very high current, and that causes the uh, intense arc flash. Okay, got it. Thank you. All right, next question for you. What are the rules or policies or codes or standards that mandate that a facility owner complete an arc flash study? Well, when they, when they are doing the arc flash study, they have to consider the amount of the energy it will, it will be dispatched or arc flash incident energy. When they are doing the arc flash study, if they reach to the level that is high and they will need, let's say, category three to put their arc flash suit and they want to protect the person, they will decide to reduce the time. When they are applying the arc flash system, the detection time to reduce. When we are using the normal uh, protective relay, we are dealing with the 30 millisecond uh, operation time at the minimum, but our flash system, as I mentioned, we are dealing with the two milliseconds. So in the system, if you do the calculation and you, you figure out by reducing the 30, 40 milliseconds, you will be in a lower category of the incident energy, then we will decide to apply. All right, very good. Um, let's see here, we've got another question coming in. Could you please discuss retrofit options? 
Um, retrofit means we are adding the sensor or arc flash system to the existing switch gear. There are some some system or some relay that we can just easily add them to the existing arc uh, existing switch gear. Just decided to put the sensor in a different area and connect them to the device as a retrofit. It means we're not going to touch anything in the system. But remember, the major thing in this system is how fast the breaker is operating. If you are having a very slow breaker, means even we detect the arc in two milliseconds, and if our breaker is 10 cycle breaker, it's not going to help really a lot. So if we are going to retrofit the system, maybe we will end up to change the breaker with the faster breaker and the faster detection system, which is the arc system. All right, good. Thank you very much for that information. To ask a question of Farhad Moslemi with Schneider Electric, please type your question for him in the ask a question box on your screen, and we will get to as many questions as time allows. If we don't get to your question today, we'll answer as many as we can in writing, and they'll be posted online in conjunction with the on-demand version of this webcast. All right, Farhad, another question for you. These are coming in like crazy. Are arc flash relays used in lieu of arc flash constructed enclosures? Uh, one thing that we have to we have to think about is when we are using the arc resistant or arc enclosure or proof enclosure, we are not operating fast. We are just keeping the energy inside the switch gear. But having the arc flash system, we are detecting the arc ahead of the time before we put the stress in the entire switch gear. That's a detection system. So we can do the detection or we can do the prevention. We are doing, by using the arc flash system, we are doing the uh, detecting the arc ahead of the time before we put the stress in the switch. Sure, sure, okay. Um, let's see, this one is a little bit more complex. Could you please outline the advantages and disadvantages of optical arc detection methods and then alternate methods or technologies besides optical arc detection methods? Yeah, one thing that I explained in my presentation was the pressure sensor. That's the one common one that they are using a lot all around. And it used to be used in some architecture system. But the pressure sensor, uh, they are a bit slower compared to the arc sensor. That's the reason now, nowadays, more architecture systems, they are leaning towards the light detection system because it's much faster. All right, let's take a look at this next question. This is about the National Electrical Code, the 2017 edition. So 2017 NEC 240.87B, related question. Of the seven methods indicated, when is it appropriate to not use or to use one of the methods indicated? And then there's a the second part of the question, and I can repeat any of this, Farhad. Um, it, are any of those options more widely used in industry? What's the most maintenance friendly or cost effective? Yes, they, they, let's see, just, just let me put a couple of examples. If you are using, let's say, ERMS switch, which, which one is, is one of the cheapest ones to put the uh, emergency reduction maintenance switch right beside the panel, that's a cheap method, but remember it could be a let's say personal mistakes and the guy is leaving the system for what to put the switch back or we can switch the relay from one protection group to another one which is a we decide to reduce the or make the system more sensitive reduce the operation time when we are putting in the maintenance mode again the issue is we forgot to put it back and we will mess up with the coordination between that switch gear and other switch gear Applying the differential bus bar means we have to add the extra CT on the system. And I show you that we will be limited between the CTs. Or one of the old methods that they used to use was the zone selective interlocking. 
it will work, but remember that in that method, we will be using the pickup and then sending the blocking signal to another relay, probably to the hard wire, and that will put extra time. We, are, we were looking around 150 milliseconds when we are applying the zone selecting interval. Well, it depends what we are looking for. Cheapest, we are, we are having some, some sort of the ERMS, or more complicated, we can go with the R flash with the current sensing and everything. Sure, yeah, I think that answer, it depends, uh, works for a lot of responses here. All right, let's look at the next question here. Uh, what about the actual advice that has the sensor? Does the relay reduce the incidence energy in the equipment itself? Sorry, repeat again. Sure. What about the actual device with the sensor? Does the relay reduce the incident energy in the equipment itself? What relay will do, relay will reduce the operation detection and control time. As I mentioned, when we are using the relay, in the calculation of the incident energy, time is a major factor. Then we are applying our relay with the sensor we are reducing the detection and control time. And with that, we will end up to reduce the incident energy in the system. Okay, let's see here. Next question for you. Why do we not use voltage wave harmonics generated by the arc to sense the arc flash? Yeah, that's a good question. The issue is when you when we are detecting the harmonic, it means we have to let's say first finish one cycle and then analyze it with the Fourier series and figure out how many how much component we are having, let's say, for the second harmonic, third harmonic, fifth harmonic, what we have. And that will take lots of time. And modeling the R flash is it's very hard. We can see this is like a noise in the system. And I didn't see any specific art flash, let's say, pattern to say, okay, this is an art flash, and then detect it. I would say that's because of the time that we, we will need to analyze the art and figure out how, what harmonic on that cycle, and it will take time. When we are dealing with the light detection, we're not going to wait for one second, uh, sorry, one cycle. In the first millisecond, we detected and we decided there is a arc. That's the fastest way that we can do. Harmonic will take more time. All right, thank you. Um, please type your question for our expert presenter in the Ask a Question box on your screen, and we'll get to as many as we can. Questions that we do not get to today will be posted online with the on-demand version of this webcast. And don't forget, if you'd like to download a certificate of completion or a copy of the presentation, use the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen. All right, Farhad, we've got time for a few more questions here. Next question for you. When we have a fuse as one of the elements in the switch gear cubicle, is it necessary to have light and current sensor in this cubicle? Uh, light, I would say yes, both of them we can have them. But, the, but the, remember, when we are having a fuse, we're not going to be able to treat the fuse. So when we are applying our our flash system, we can detect the current even after the fuse, or we can put the sensor wherever we think. We might have an arc, arc flash, possibility to have arc flash. And then we, we have to send our trip to the upstream breaker. Yes, if there is a fuse like a VT compartment, we, we do have a fuse, but still we can use the arc sensor on that. All right, thanks, Farhad. Uh, next question for you. What's the difference on an arc flash study of a DC system, so a direct current system, from an AC system or an alternating current system? Well, 
there is much more or flash hazard in the DC system. I'm not that much familiar, but we have to remember the big difference is when we are having an arc in the AC system, in any cycle, we are passing the zero, uh, zero current or zero crossing at the beginning, middle of the cycle and end of the cycle. We have a three times during each cycle to interrupt the current. But in the DC arc, we are always having the current and we are not crossing the zero and the system is much harder to interrupt the arc in the DC system compared to AC system. So as I say, in the AC system, we are alternatively passing the zero, zero crossing and the best time that we can interrupt the arc. Right, okay. Okay, so this next question for you is switching gears just a little bit. Can we use the arc flash sensors in lieu of higher AIC ratings on the electrical gear, or are the sensors an added safety feature? Yeah, let, let me take this one offline. Okay. Not a problem. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, this goes back to something that you talked about kind of toward the end. Which of the seven NEC 240.87B methods is represented by the light and pressure arc detection methods? Is that yeah. instantaneous trip settings or what is that? No, the one that we are using is the, okay, let me just bring it up. I believe it was method number four. Uh, one second. Yeah, among those ones, there is one of them that is says energy reduction, energy reduction active arc flash mitigation system. That's the one it will refer to the arc sensor detection with the arc sensor, number four. All right, thank you for that clarification. All right, well, it looks like we have time for just one last question. And this question, is there a curve, any curve for arc or explosion propagation over time to assess efficacy of the detection and protection system? Mm. Not the curve, no. We can we can just imagine that this system is acting like a I squared T, increasing the incident energy. If I'm understanding correctly, no, we don't have that such a such a curve. Okay. Well, thank you for that information. Thank you for the great questions. Thanks to our audience, and again, thank you to our presenter, Farhad Muslami, for sharing his time and expertise. I would also like to extend a special thank you to Schneider Electric for sponsoring today's event. And now that we are just about done, we want to hear how we did. The exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as this webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcast. Finally, on behalf of Consulting, Specifying, Engineer, and CFE Media and Technology, I'd like to thank you for attending. This now concludes our webcast. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>